How's it everybody? Welcome to Exponential Africa Live, a weekly live show that focuses on bringing the best thought leadership, technology and innovation to the African continent and the world. On Saturday morning, I was running, obviously during lockdown times, and I saw parents with their babies, with their five-year-olds, with their 10-year-olds and their teenagers, and I realized that they're all concerned about how to educate their kids so that they can thrive in the future and make a positive contribution to society. That's why I'm so excited about tonight's show, and it's extra special because we're celebrating Africa Day, which promotes unity, deeper regional integration, and recommits Africa to a common destiny. Our mission as Singularity Youth South Africa and Manmade is to help hashtag future-proof Africa by building a global community of change makers who can help solve some of Africa's and the world's greatest challenges to lead the way into the future. We do this through various educational experiences that educate, empower and inspire and by building our community and network. COVID-19 has completely disrupted the world's direction and will never be the same. I believe we have three choices. Either we can give up, give in or give it all we've got. We're going to give it all we've got and we hope that you will too. We need to come together to forge a new direction and use the opportunity to reimagine how we do things. We know it's not going to be easy, but it will be worth it, and we need to stay resilient. Tonight we'll be covering reimagining education and why we think that now is the right time to radically improve our education system. Even before COVID-19, we all knew education was broken, needed a new way, and there are already many great cases of progress in motion. This is one conversation of many that we need to have. Einstein said, the world we have created is a product of our thinking. It cannot be recreated without changing our thinking. So we need to think differently in order to build a new world and be courageous. Tonight we'll be covering some of the latest tech stories, showcasing the African Leadership Academy, and then we'll have a discussion with our illustrious panel on how we can reimagine education. And then we'll end off with a performance by the Muses. Tonight we have Esther Wojcicki, Singularity University Faculty on Learning, an internationally known author, teacher, and the founder of the Palo Alto High School Media Arts Program, where she taught many change makers, including Steve Jobs' daughter. Jos Dirks, who is our SUSE faculty on the future of education, as well as the founder of Binova AR, and another living legend, Taddy Blatcher, who is also our SUSE faculty on education and human potential, and Taddy has put over 19,000 students, formerly unemployed youth, through higher and vocational education and into jobs. A huge shout out to our partners, who this would not be possible without, our collaboration partner, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, our global partner, Deloitte, and our strategic partner, MTN. Thanks for your commitment and dedication to making a positive impact in South Africa and Africa. Lastly, if you want to see more of these weekly episodes, please make sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube page and register on the website to get more info and be eligible for giveaways. Great, let's jump right into it. COVID-19 stopped millions of students from attending classes and surprisingly, the outcries have been everything but we don't need no education. Here are a few of the reactions from students, parents, and teachers that are pure gold. At least the teachers are maintaining their humor. Our ability to adapt is one of our most important skills, and now we know that we can adapt fast. The shift from on-campus learning to learning online initiated rapidly. While this model is not without its challenges, we now know that what we thought was impossible just needed a nudge from disruption. Let's take a look at what's happening on the tech and education front. The remote experiment Blackboard, Moodle, and Google Classroom have all jumped on board to digitize the classroom. But hitting the books still means hands-on experience, 
and arguably the most practical subject is in the science lab. But still, the case for online labs is very strong. They free up funds for bigger purchases like 3D modeling software. In medical teaching, interactive interfaces like anatomage have made human cadavers redundant. Online learning also opens up curriculums for shared learning, leveraging strengths to teach diverse students. Should the digital shift be successful, the magic of science will spread further, faster. AI immersive tech and one-on-one -on -one distance learning companies like Affectiva have developed emotional AI technology, where the forward-facing camera on a tablet will tell the teacher if a child is excited, confused, or bored. This allows educators and edtech platforms to adapt their strategies, ensuring that students get personalized content. This delightful AI generates words that sound real. AI has a new rock star, a framework that powers chatbots and breakthrough text adventure games like AI Dungeon. It also happens to power a one-shot web page, thisworddoesnotexist.com, where it sprouts mumbo-jumbo words that sound plausible. As AI replicates patterns and data, it generates new sentences the AI gets a little confident and makes up new words while it's at it. So why is this important that this AI sprouts gibberish? I hear my English teacher ask. And the answer is simple. New languages lead to new types of discoveries in information. Apple's new glass is looking full. Apple has boldly taken their next steps into the world of virtual reality. Rumor has it they are working on a pair of Apple augmented reality glasses that will sync and work with your iPhone, similar to the watch. They've also recently bought Next VR, And you know it's getting exciting when Apple's making these kinds of plays. New findings for sight from brain implant. In a massive breakthrough for visual prosthetics, scientists at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston have successfully developed a brain implant that allows both blind and sighted participants to see. The device relays information straight to electrodes implanted in the brain. Participants have described seeing glowing spots or lines forming the letters like skywriting. This is just absolutely incredible. And as it turns out, astronauts are not big in Japan. Giving a whole new meaning to working from home, Japanese startup Gitai wants to send avatars to work in space. People will remote control these semi-autonomous robots from Earth. This would make space research cheaper and safer. Bloomberg News reports that Japan's space agency could save 90% of the cost associated with sending each person to a space station. Pretty far out concepts. <music> Next up, we turn the spotlight to great African innovation in the realm of education. As we know, students and learners are unique and their learning institutions should be anything but cookie cutter. The African Leadership University is one such higher education institution taking learning to versatile hearts. Fred Swanaker, the university's co-founder, is passionate about African development and especially African leadership. With a strict ban on lectures, students who attend this university engage in lively debate and real-life applications of the knowledge they are discovering with their peers. We followed the story of one of the engineering groups from the African Leadership College campus in Mauritius to get a better understanding of how it is that they are mastering skills in an unclassroom style. The group's mission was to develop ways to conserve bee populations on the African continent. The undergrads developed an app to collate measurements in and around halves so that keepers have information about each half steadily at their fingertips. Now here's a differentiator. The students went into the field, chatted to the beekeepers and established all the parameters themselves. Once they figured out how to maintain and preserve halves, they developed their action plan. Next they established their roles for their project plan. The group roped in an ALC student interested in coding who developed the program that pulled together the engineering work on the mobile app. Another student interested in electronics jumped at the opportunity to handle the hardware side of the project. The team kept communication wide open to identify challenges and embrace learnings as the project was unfolding. 
Students found the hands-on approach and the autonomy that came with it pushed them to interrogate problems just that much further, rather than relying on a lecturer to present the answers. The discomfort and frustration associated with this method is what yields such great results. The ALU has two campuses, one in Mauritius and another in Rwanda. They offer undergraduate courses for eight degrees and an MBA, and you can find them at www.aluEducation.com. It should be on your screen right now. Please make sure to go check them out. They are doing absolutely amazing things across Africa. As you've heard, this show is free and will continue to always be free. And if you feel you're getting great value and appreciate what we're trying to do, you can scan the QR code on your screen. Do donations will go towards helping educate students in South Africa. Maharishi Institute has switched almost 1,000 students to online classes for their degrees since the 20th of April, and 20 different subjects are concurrently running online daily. All these students are from really tough financial backgrounds, but about 21% of the students have either not been able to join classes at all or are on the verge of dropping out because of lack of data and some lack of access to internet-enabled devices. As these students fall more and more behind, they risk not being able to catch up and lose the op opportunity of graduating and getting employment into a quality job. Any help would be highly appreciated with any internet accessible phones or tablets and assistance with helping students with data costs for attending classes raised through the online session. So you can scan the QR code on the screen and all the proceeds will go to Maharishi Institute to help educate South Africans. We'll leave the QR code up on the screen as much as possible, allowing you the opportunity to donate. One more announcement about the Maharishi Institute, and this is a big one. One learner stands a chance to win a USA business degree here in South Africa with the Maharishi Institute. The student who wins this opportunity will get all the South African qualifications, daily lunch, and all learning materials. The value of this opportunity is worth $125,000, a whopping 2.2 million rand. Make sure to register on our website to be eligible for the prize. We will be randomly selecting the winner from the registrations and we'll announce the winner during the, works, the Workforce of the Future show happening on the 29th of June. Thank you, Maharishi Institute. We are now going to move on to our Reimagining Education panel. It's time to move into the main segment of tonight's show, Reimagining Education. Anyone today has children either in school or university is thinking, how are my kids going to get the best education during and post the lockdowns and how to keep them up to date with the curriculum? Currently, many kids are remote learning. However, the education system is playing catch up. There are many challenges with learning online, like data costs, focus group, group learning, etc. How do we solve this in the near and distant future? And how must the teachers adapt? To this new world. I love this gem from Malcolm X where he said, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. I'm pleased to welcome our panel today. We have Esther Wojcicki, Jos Dirks and Taddy Blatcher. Esther Wojcicki is the CEO at Global Moonshots in Education, American journalist, educator and vice chair of the Creative Commons Advisory Council, author of How to Raise Successful People and Moonshots in Education. Esther, how are you doing? Oh, great. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Wow. Thanks so much for joining us. I know it's, it's very early in uh, Palo Alto. Yes, it's 7, seven o'clock. No, now it's 8.16. Amazing. So, so Esther, I've been that reading bad. one of your books. Yeah. How to Raise Successful People. And I must say, I'm reading it and I actually want to study this book because it's so insightful. Um, and the forward starts from your three daughters that, that, that write about, about how you brought them up in the book. 
Um, do you want to tell us how you brought your kids up a bit and, uh, and what they've achieved? So, um, yes, I was a young mother with three daughters, all born within a five-year period. And my goal for my daughters um, was to make them as independent as possible. That was my number one goal. And uh, there were no books available at the time. They were born at the end, 1968 to 1973. And uh, the only book available to me at that time was Dr. Spock. And Dr. Spock was concentrated on physical health. And so um, what I did is I tried to teach my daughters early on as much as I possibly can. But that was kind of practical learning, you know, how not to fall in the swimming pool or, you know, how to cross the street or how to how to read a street sign, even though you couldn't read a street sign. And um, and it worked out because what happened is that em empowering them and giving them these opportunities, um, they felt much more confident and they trusted themselves. And they grew up with this uh, philosophy that they could pretty much do anything as long as they put their mind to it. And that was what I was trying to do. I wanted them to be as, as comfortable with themselves and trust and respect themselves. And so um, it worked. And today, for those of you who may not know it, uh, they all succeeded unbelievably well. Susan, my oldest daughter, is the CEO of YouTube today. Uh, Janet, my second daughter, is a professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco, and her focus is on childhood obesity. And also today, she's the epidemiologist working on the COVID issues we are, that the world is facing. And my third daughter is Anne, and she is the founder and CEO of a company called 23andMe, which is a personal genetics company. So they all did something that they were really passionate about. And part of the reason that they were able to be, I think, as passionate as they are is because they believed in themselves. And that doesn't mean that they weren't polite to other people. It was more that they listened to their inner self, their inner voice, and that that voice basically said to them, well, I can do it. And so that's what I try to do in my program at Palo Alto High School with all my students, when there have been thousands since I've been teaching, it's hard to believe, for 39 years. Uh, yeah, Incredible. probably most of you are even 39, yes. Um, and it works with my students also. Um, and I've had some very famous students um, like Lisa Brennan Jobs, uh, Steve Jobs' daughter was my student. And then also a famous movie star that many of you might have heard of, James Franco, was also my student and a uh, basketball player. So you don't have to be famous for like being a doctor or a lawyer or a CEO or anything. You can be what, 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 is, what something is that you want to be, that you're really excited about. And um, yeah, Jeremy Lin was also a student of mine and he is a well-known basketball player. So it just shows that whatever it is that you're interested in, provided that you are determined and you don't give up. That doesn't mean, as I said, that you do things that create problems for other people. It's more that you work together as a team. And I, I must say that the African Leadership University that I just saw, with, and all of you have seen, with Fred Swanaker is absolutely an amazing university. And their pedagogy, the way they teach, is exactly the way that I teach in my program, that he has a moniker in, the, in which he says, no lectures. And um, that's the same thing that I do, no lectures. I mean, maybe I talk for the most 10 minutes, but the majority of the time is the students are peer to peer learning. And my logic on that is that students learn the most when they interact with each other and when they're when they have a goal that they're working on together 
By the way, the one thing that I do as a teacher that's important for everybody to know is that I do set the goals usually for a class. So for example, this is a journalism class. So in this class, we're gonna be studying journalism, but that's about it. Um, the otherwise kids come up with the ideas and the way they're supposed to be working and um, they work together. Uh, and all of the educational research out there shows that 90% of the learning always takes place outside of the classroom. And that was the traditional classroom. And the reason is because outside the classroom, you talk to each other and you interact. And that's what's so important. Okay. Thank you. I think it probably... No, thanks so much for that. Uh, we, I love what you talk about in the book, your trick methodology, which is about trust, respect, independent courage, and we'll get into a bit of, about that uh, a bit later. Our next panelist that we have for this evening is Joss Dirks. Joss Dirks is the SUSE faculty member on Future of Education and AR, and is the CEO and co-founder of Binova AR, using AR and ER to build personalized mentors and ch change the way the world learns. She's a best-selling author, has lived in 12 countries and traveled to 99. Founded an award-winning NGO, recognized by former First Lady Michelle Obama and launched M-Girls, which provided 65,000 girls with free health information. Joss, welcome to the show. Hey, Mick, how are you doing? Thanks so much for having me today. Oh, good, uh, thanks. How, you, you're busy in uh, Netherlands at the moment. That's right. I am in isolation in the Netherlands. Yes, I am. And the last two countries that I was in were South Africa and the United Arab Emirates. So I could have gotten stuck in either of those, but I am here. Amazing. And uh, Jos, do you want to tell us a little bit about Binova AR and why is it so important to learn using emotional intelligence? And what is that exactly? Yes, for sure, Mick. Thanks. That's a great question. So. At Binova AI, we believe in sustainable and scalable education. And in order for us to do that, we have to make sure that everybody has access to equal education that they can use and that they can leverage on devices or within platforms or anywhere where they are in a way that's very easy to access for them. So what we've done at Binova AI is we've used artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence to build a 360 degree learning journey for every single body that uses our learning, our ways of thinking about learning. And when you talk about emotional intelligence, that's actually where it's at. That's actually what's key. And I think, you know, when we're able to say, okay, how am I turning up as a human? How am I turning up as somebody that's interested in the world, that's interested in learning, that's curious, that has a mind that wants to expand, that wants to absorb, that wants to give back, we actually become way better students. And our entire methodology at Binova is really shaped on that kind of thinking. Amazing. And uh, uh, how, how does the artificial intelligence build, is, how is it built into the, the platform? That's a great question. So the AI piece is a little complicated, right? We're not all masters at algorithms. My co-founder fortunately is, so we've got a great team, um, great developers working with us. And what we've tried to do is take, of course, you're not going to build every single algorithm from scratch. That would be a crazy job. But what we have done is we've taken algorithms and further developed them to meet levels of consciousness that we believe are really important when it comes to AI and EI. And the way that the mentors work is you're essentially starting to replicate the relationship between a student and a teacher. Why? not to replace actual teachers, but to help facilitate the work that they're already doing. We know that there are there's a lack of teachers globally, and there's also so many students and even so many employees that need access to skills to thrive in the 21st century. And those skills, many of them are actually based in emotional intelligence. So using AI to manage this combination is actually really fantastic. And it's what will allow us to expand and to make sure that more and more people have access to learning and to quality education that'll serve them. Thanks so much. Wow, that's, that's really exciting. And we'll hear a bit more from you in, in a bit in the Q&A. Our final panelist for this evening is T Dr. Teddy Bletcher. 
Uh, Dr. Tadi Blatcher is a Singularity U South Africa faculty member with a focus on exponential education. He is the CEO of the Maharishi Invisibility Institute, which has helped formerly unemployed youth earn billions of rands collectively, and the Imvula Empowerment Trust to transform BE empowerment in South Africa. He is a national chair, chairperson of the South African education system reform initiative called E-Cubed, entrepreneurship, education, and employability across the South Africa school system for over 12 million school learners. Taddy, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Mick. Thanks, and uh, you, you, you're talking to us from uh, Johannesburg. Yeah, very far away. I'm from the furthest. <laughs> Ted, um, you've, you've had a, a, quite an amazing journey on trying to transform education and you're doing some really exciting developments at the moment. Can you tell us a little bit about the E-Cubed initiative? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, E-Cubed e actually fits in very, very nicely with what is the sound coming through okay, Mick? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Wonderful. Yeah, EQ fits in very well with uh, exactly what you saw that example with Fred's uh, African Leadership University in Mauritius and what Esther was talking about and what Joss was talking about. Uh, so it's all focused on how can we ultimately get 100% of school leavers out of the South African school system uh, really being useful to themselves and society and economically uh, active and have a sustainable economic future. Uh, so it's focused on how can 100% of school leavers leave school either into employment or further education, ideally higher education uh, or entrepreneurship, uh, developing the creativity and mindsets um, that they ultimately can create successful organizations and successful businesses. It's a very exciting initiative that's been totally bought into and uh, endorsed by the president um, who wants to see entrepreneurship and 21st century learning skills coming into the whole education system. Um, uh, the Minister of Education um, you know, is publicly uh, endorsing and, and uh, building up this initiative, uh, the Director General and, and so on. So it's a very exciting time, I think, for education in South Africa I think everybody's realized that if we just keep pushing harder and harder and harder at what we've always been doing, which is just high metric results and content-based memorization, rote learning, what we all went through, uh, we're just not going to develop the kind of economic future and social future and country that we want for everybody. Um, so I think the Department of Education are incredibly enlightened and uh, really wanting to see change. So I think with, you know, within the next three, four years, millions of learners um, we'll be starting to incorporate project-based learning, game-based learning, play-based learning. Already it's hundreds of thousands, uh, but soon it will be many millions. Incredible. Well, that really is super exciting. Uh, so currently, are you, are you piloting with some students? Yeah, so we currently are piloting. Uh, last year, uh, we reached about 250,000 together with the Lego Foundation that are working uh, a wonderful organization called Care for Education uh, together with Lego and UNICEF working with the younger students from grade R to grade uh, three. Um, and then um, our team, the E-Cube team, are working from grade four to grade 11. Um, but that's not going to start getting really massified because um, now with the trim down curriculum, uh, the department's asked us in three of the subjects um, to create trim down projects and games and things that students can learn a lot of the content they've missed, but in a way that's much more fun and going to be much quicker for them to learn and to catch up um, rather than just boring, you know, the same old, same old. Um, yeah, so soon million, millions of kids will be engaging. Um, as I say, hundreds of thousands of 250,000 last year. Wow, that, that, that's really uh, exciting to hear. I, I, I'm a gamer myself and I, and I really believe in a much more immersive experience uh, to, to get the knowledge in faster and in a more quality way. Um, but yeah, Ted, it's because you weren't good at school, Mick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I used to play a lot of games. Um, but Ted, also just tell us a little bit about Maharishi Institute. Sorry, you broke up yes, there? So Maharishi Institute is... Uh, oh, sorry, I, I was just saying it was because you weren't good at school that... 
you, you would be passionate about this kind of approach to learning because all the people that achieve great stuff usually tend to have found school very boring and frustrating. So uh, um, just the, the, the Mauritian Institute's based on the premise that uh, really um, life is beautiful, life is infinite, a human being is infinite. Um, there's no limit you can achieve in terms of anything, love, creativity, hope, peace, um, if, if one were to develop a human being fully in a holistic way, uh, then a human being can actually achieve anything. And, and we set out to prove that by creating the first free university in South Africa. And what we wanted to prove was um, at a time where just so many people were saying the youth of the country were doomed, they can't do anything, etc. Uh, they're just entitled or useless or X, Y, Z. Um, we wanted to kind of turn the traditional university model on its head. And the traditional universities kind of, you know, all the Ivy Leagues, you know, all the great universities, they bring in the geniuses in society. So you're taking, you know, 0.1% to 1% of the best people in a society. And out the other end, it's just completely amazing. You're putting out all these geniuses. But um, what we wanted to prove is that you could take very average people who, uh, you know, as society would measure them, and even big viabilities in society, people with... Uh, drug addictions, it, who've been involved in crime, people who um, uh, really have done really badly at school, who've, uh, you know, really proved averageness on kind of on most metrics, and you could prove that these individuals could be genius out as well, um, if you really develop them fully. And so uh, we've done this now over 19,000 times. We've taken over 19,000 unemployed youth off the streets in South Africa, across the country, um, and help these individuals. And they now earn billions of rands between them and their uh, you know, engineers and accountants and stockbrokers and leaders in many domains in South Africa's economy. And it's just really proving uh, you know, this is what human beings are capable of. And edu education, you know, this is the most exciting time ever in history for education, but uh, if we can develop the full potential and if that's what we focus on. No, thanks so much, Ted. I mean, we are so lucky to have someone like you on our shores, and uh, we are really excited to see <laughs> what you're going to be doing in the next couple of years. I mean, already with these achievements, it's just extraordinary. Um, guys, the, the, the YouTube is going crazy. The questions are, are, are rolling in. We're going to start diving into some of the questions. Uh, last week, we had a, a, quite a number of questions around reimagining education. And we wanted to pull those forward to, to this group so that uh, they could be answered by you guys. Um, the first question is from Rahul Patel, where um, he was asking, I'm sure many of us have children who are remote learning. What is the panel's view on the future of remote learning? Um, and anyone can start. Esther, do you want to kick it off? Okay, yeah. So I think remote learning is here to stay. Um, school might start again in a traditional manner, but it's still going to involve a lot more remote learning. And I think prior to this um, pandemic, which forced education into doing things that they had been thinking about doing, but had not done before, which is remote learning, um, I think that they'll see that there are a lot of advantages to remote learning and to giving kids an opportunity to work together in groups, maybe groups two or three, and learn using a lot of the resources online, uh, resources, on, resources on YouTube, uh, resources from Coursera or from Code Academy, or there's resources everywhere. And so I think that it's going to continue. Um, and I think also the school day is probably going to be modified. It might not be as long, or it might be um, half the student body going one day and the other half the other day. The schools don't know yet. And I don't think anyone knows. But I think it will change. And we will still see remote learning as part of the, a part of the way that we're educating. Uh, so what does this mean for the future of for traditional and mortar schools then? I love this idea of adaptability and for we're the, going to be recreating our schedule. But will the schools still be there? I think this I think the schools will still be there. 
And the reason I think the schools will be there is because the main thing that students are missing today is other students. They're missing their friends. And school serves as a common meeting ground where kids can get together. And <clears throat> without having a face-to-face -face interaction, a place to have face-to-face -face interaction, um, it's pretty hard to prepare for the world because you know we're, the world is basically human interaction and social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that will still be here. And then Joe's talked about, um, you know, avatars and AI and, um, you know, different types of learning. I think that will also be part of our learning package. Um, it'll take a little bit more in the way of development to get it there, but I think it's coming. And um, and I, I do think that that's what's happening. And then Tati talked about all these people that have had a lot of issues in life and he's managed to provide an incredible place for them to be educated. And, um, and the work that he's done is amazing. And the people that have come out of that Maharishi University are amazing people. And I think more of that will continue, but you can't just have, um, you know, an in-person facility anymore. I think you also have to have online programs and it will help, um, it'll help people learn more effectively because if you really like to learn at 10 o'clock at night, then you can learn asynchronously at 10 o'clock at night when just turn on the program. And um, so I think that the brick and mortar institutions will still be there with no question. It's just that they will be supported more effectively by online programs and AI. I'd love to see what you think. So there's Mick and I just have to share some thoughts on this as well, if that's all right. But sure. there's so many ways to think about education. And at the end of the day, it's a deeply personal experience. So we can sit here and project and think about an amalgamation of data that we have also accelerated by COVID-19 that make us want to say, okay, well, this is how we think it'll go and perhaps we'll still have schools and we will have digital. But what might be nice is for us to revisit the actual problems that we're trying to solve, which are really about creating a space where as many people as possible have access to the opportunity to develop their full skill sets. And that can happen in many different ways. That can happen in a theater environment, in a sporting environment, in a gaming environment, in an AI environment. And the way that we like to think about education is how do we make sure that that becomes more scalable and more sustainable so that it's not just select amount of students here, a pocket of students in an area there, or that country doing well, because then we continue to widen the education gap that we already see is so prevalent around the world. Definitely at Binova, we think that yes, technology is a great enabler, but the EI piece is actually equally important. And a lot of the activities that are built in are actually built in offline so that students have to connect with one another or connect with their family or create something with their hands or go for a meditation and actually reflect back on what that meditation meant. We actually believe in meditation for kids because that's actually really where mindfulness starts and where we can start to really engage a young and curious brain. So there's different ways of looking at education. I don't know if it's you know, will it be this way? Will it be that way? But let's do our world and its people justice by building as many different systems that work to ensure that more and more people have the opportunity to reach their full potential. Oh, thanks. I love that. And that, that leads completely into uh, Teddy, if you, if you want to comment on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I loved Yossa's answer as, as, as well as Esther's. And, um, you know, it's not just about is education here or there, it's also in here. 
and and that's where great education starts. I think, as 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 you said, uh, you know, what marks great education really is what a human being becomes. And um, the goal the goal of great education must be to produce great people. And great people will all be different. They'll all be unique. They'll all have their own incredible gifts and talents to give to the world. Um, and education is that tool and that journey to unfold that genius within each person uh, to give their gifts to the world. And um, so how does one do that in the most efficient way, in the most um, practical way? And, um, uh, you know, as Jos was saying, there's massive uh, you know, inequality in education um, quality that people get. We see in South Africa now, um, you know, all the private schools, everyone's on Zoom, all the kids are in school, it's like nothing's changed. Uh, you, you know, they're all online and we know all the public schools, millions of kids, you know, are, are not getting that same opportunity. So in, in South, South Africa is a country where I often say, you know, quality education's literally, you know, it's not a luxury, it's literally a matter of life and death because uh, we have so much unemployment, young people get into gangs, they you know, get killed, they get shot, they get put in jail, all kinds of things happen. And if you, if you go back to the seeds of where this all started, it's how did that young person get an opportunity to grow up in the broader sense of education? And, and, and so it, it's, it's a human right, but how do, we, how, how do we democratize great education for everybody? Now, technology and this online solution is definitely a huge you know, amazing part of this this puzzle because online, as as Esther said, you know, you can reach an unlimited number of people at an incredibly low cost in a very high quality way. It's fantastic from a content point of view. It's it's good for the learning process point of view. But then you still need the kind of socialization. Uh, you still need face to face interactions because human beings have to grow through experiences. And um, and as you said, uh, you know, we're huge believers in in the development right from the level of consciousness because a human has all these infinite things that I spoke about in the beginning that really have to be developed deep down inside. So the way, way we think about it is that the future of education is about mass personalization. It's going to be about how do you get the very best to every individual who is completely unique so that they can learn in the fastest way uh, to become the human being that they can ultimately be. And technology is a part of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. No, thanks. I mean, I think this leads into, it's all about trust at the end of the day and creating this trust between the learner and the teacher. Uh, Esther, you talk about the trick method. Can you explain what that is exactly? Yes, I thank you for that. Uh, yes, I talk about the trick method. This is the method no that tricks, I came Esther. up with. Um, <laughs> no tricks. <laughs> this is the method I came up with that works really effectively in the classroom works for parents, works in the corporate world, and it's trick, and it's no tricks, yeah, right. But it stands for trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and courage, and kindness. And uh, so what's really important is number one, trust. You know, you can't really have any of the others without trust, and trust and respect go hand in hand. And so in the classroom, you have to trust your students. And the question is, why would you want to do that? Why would a teacher want to do it? Well, the answer is, when you trust the students, they feel it. They know it. And then they trust themselves. They say basically, oh, that person that I respect trusts me. So I must be, you know, I must be pretty good. And so they trust and respect and tend to believe in themselves. The longer this goes on, in other words, the first part of the semester and continues all year long, the more the student grows and develops into somebody that believes in themselves and is willing to take a risk to achieve the goals that they want. And I'm talking about a risk. A risk is creativity. Um, because anybody that is creative, uh, if whatever you're doing that is creative is pretty much risky because if it's creative it means nobody else did it before and it could possibly fail. But if you feel, if you have trust and respect for yourself and if your teacher feels the same way and if you're in a community of people 
that trust and respect each other, then it works really effectively. And then uh, part of trust and respect, and the third part is independence. So if you trust people, respect them, you give them independence, you allow them to collaborate, and you treat them with kindness. And that's what the acronym tri trick is. And I recommend my book. It's a really simple, easy way to understand this. Uh, and it's called How to Raise Successful People, Simple Lessons for Radical Results. And it is in bookstores, I know, and it's online in South Africa as well. And Are we going to be giving so, away a few um, of them uh, a bit later? Yeah, Sorry it's, it, it helps parents. It, it helps parents because the, everybody has this question about like, what should I do as a parent? I feel so you know inadequate. I'm not quite sure how to do it. But the idea is to give parents an idea some skills and some goals and some patterns of behavior that work really well. Um, if you can give, start out with your child, you know, a one-year-old, a two-year-old, and give them an opportunity to believe in themselves as they learn to do things in the world, they that will develop with them and grow as you give them more opportunities. The more you control your child, the less confident they are in themselves. And um, uh, it just makes sense. And all the research shows that it, that people just don't feel good about themselves as long as they feel they always have to ask somebody else for help. And that's my goal is to make sure that you can, you can definitely ask other people for help, but you should also feel confident and good about yourself that you can do it as well. So that's the main, that's what TRIC stands for. And that is what I would love to get into the schools all over South Africa. No, thanks. Thanks so much. And the world, Ted, Ted, by the way. Ted, how do the teachers adapt to this, this uh, lockdown and this remote learning? You know, it's been, it's been quite difficult for the teachers as well as the students. And what advice can you give to the teachers? Mick, we, we actually are working on an incredibly exciting WhatsApp platform. Um, and uh, the idea is to be ultimately able to reach every teacher on a daily basis um, so that they can get access to uh, good information from, from the Department of Education, um, but, but also be helped with the kind of inundation because there's so many free resources and there's so many... Uh, you know, things that teachers are just, I think, feeling inundated, not knowing what's going to work and, and, and how they're going to do it. So um, this is a very exciting thing. I don't know if you've seen the COVID um, health line that the Minister of Health is always putting up, um, that WhatsApp that like a million South Africans are accessing per day, that WhatsApp channel. Um, so we're creating a similar thing called Teacher Connect, um, which we already have piloting. Uh, it's very exciting and we hope to grow it uh, significantly. Um, yeah, but te teachers are the backbone of our education system, and um, you know, a lot of people in South Africa are very negative about uh, teachers, but that is just such a kind of a one-sided, warped view of, uh, you, you know, just the hundreds of thousands of individuals, so many of whom are so passionate about their kids and making a difference, and uh, we need to work with teachers in this country, and so that's a big part of EQ. It's, it's the backbone of what we're doing. Now, also, may I adjust you? Do you want to comment on that a bit further? Yeah, Mick, I love I love that because um, one of the things that we've done with the AI mentors is as well roll them out on WhatsApp. They are, they also you know we also do Slack and Microsoft Teams and Google, but especially for the African continent, WhatsApp is so easy. And if everybody has access to this personalized AI mentor, that not just serves content, you know, rolling content, but actually can personalize the experience and can give feedback. And that, that's something that our AI mentors can do. Actually, they provide feedback on where you need upskilling or where you could use a little bit more information. They actually check in on you. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Take a breath, right? So there's a lot going on there around not just the teacher in their role, in their profession, but their teacher as a human being showing up for their classes and for the country at large, because that's something that we can't forget. You know, if we forget about the importance of education or the role that teachers play as pillars in society, 
then we basically forget and we give up on our future. And that's something that's so beautiful about education because it's such a personal topic. It affects all of us so deeply and we can all look back on amazing teachers that we had and incredible educational experiences that we've gone through. And it's so crucial now that we don't treat this pandemic as something that all of a sudden, you know, we realize there's a problem. No, the problem's been there before. We've had this problem on our hands. But at least let's think about the best ways to work together to collaborate so that we can turn around really sustainable and really scalable solutions for the long term. And I find that super exciting because that's just a gateway to rethinking the entire education system the world over. And that's exactly what we need to be doing right now. No, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. We're going to go to some of the questions that are online. Um, Patty Blackhurst. Patty asked, Taddy spoke about online learning for young children. Um, is the thinking that all young children can also learn independently online? Ted? Yeah, so again, I want to emphasize that I think it's the marriage of the human being with technology. And remember, you know, who creates all this very cool technology? It's, it's human beings. So, uh, you know, we think technology is so amazing. I mean, it's incredible. And I think we've all been just amazed how much it's evolved. And we're all in Zoom and WhatsApp and Meet and, uh, you know, Teams and everything every day. And, and, and realizing there's so much stability and, um, and, and, and that's just kind of a base layer. I mean, on, on every level with all the AI and VR and there's just, you, you know, this incredible opportunity with technology, unimaginable opportunity. Um, but we mustn't disintermediate the human being from, from learning because learning is all about the human being. So I kind of see education in three, three parts. You've got the learner, uh, who's this young child, you're talking about the student, there's what you want them to learn, which is the content, and there's how you connect these things, which is the teacher or using technology. Um, I think uh, technology is amazing in terms of delivering content because all the knowledge that kind of in the world is sitting, you know, in the internet and um, uh, is, is available. And we've got hugely um, advanced methodologies now of, of creating you know, linkages between the learner and this content, and that's going to get more and more and more visceral and real and dynamic as more and more and more senses are brought into technology and in, into the learning process. Uh, but the critical thing as well is not to forget the human being because that's the purpose of education. So the heart, the heart, uh, you know, of um, uh, education is the heart of the human being, like you said, and uh, you know, she was talking about emotional intelligence and Esther was talking about um, all these qualities of the human being you want to develop of independence and courage and creativity. Uh, the brain, you really want to develop this brain of the human being. So it's not just about content. Content is so small when you think of what a human being is and what you want a human being to become in terms of what they can create. So uh, it's, it's critical to remember that. So it's a marriage of these things. And um, if we're going to use online learning to teach young kids, um, we, we still have to have this human intermediation uh, to help develop these things like independence and uh, critical thinking, creative thinking, etc. Now, thanks. I think that's such an important point, what you just mentioned, because a lot of questions are coming through around, you know, are, are we going to get Zoom and, and, and fatigue in these virtual platforms? Now, I know that <laughs> most parents with, that have kids know that they can spend as much time as they can on the screen. And this whole idea of screen time and how much screen time to give your kid is quite a big debate. And uh, this makes me think of the story uh, that I read about how Esther, how you dealt with screen time with your own grandkids. Uh, do you want to tell us that story? Yes. So um, we were on a vacation and um, was in Northern California, a very nice vacation. And the kids were all on their phones. And the, you know, it was just a normal situation. The minute that they got up, they were on their phones and then, then they have phones during the day and phones. And so we were thinking, gee, we went on this great vacation and um, we have no opportunity to really interact because they're on their phones all the time looking up whatever. So uh, my daughters wanted to just confiscate the phones. So we're just taking them away. 
And of course, you know how that works with kids. They get really upset. So I said instead, hey, why don't we let the kids, why don't we collaborate with them and let the kids come up with a plan of how to use the phones? And everybody was very skeptical, but they said, okay, we'll let it, we'll try it. So the kids got together, there were 10 of them, and they got together and they um, spent about an hour talking about what they wanted to do and so forth. It was actually pretty interesting to watch that meeting. Of course, I could only peek at that meeting because they didn't let us in. But then they came up at the end, they came up and they said, well, we came up with a plan. And the plan is that we will not have any phone at all between 9 a.m. in the morning and 9 p.m. at night. And I'll tell you, my daughters, we all fainted. We could not believe it. We were shocked because we never would have made a, a we would never have done anything like that. We would have made it much easier, or shorter periods of time or whatever. But the kids came up with the plan and then they stuck to it. So we didn't have to do any policing. We didn't have to remind them. They just did it. And um, so that's what I recommend. You know, whenever you have a problem with your kid being, for example, addicted to the computer or addicted to something, talk to them about, you know, how dangerous it is for them to spend that much time on the, uh, you know, on the computer or that have that much screen time. I mean, kids are actually reasonable if you talk to them about it and stop just dictating to them. And, um, and then say, well, why don't you come up with a plan that you think might work and then give me a suggestion and we'll talk about it. And that works. And that has worked for many things in our family. This idea of having, you know, conferences or giving the kids an, an, a say in whatever it is <clears throat> you're doing. That makes a big difference. Everybody wants to be heard. Everybody whether they're five years old or whether they're 35 years old. One of the most important things is to have somebody who hears you and understands you and that you can talk about your issues. And so whether it's technology or whether it's some other aspect of life, just remember that that's a very important thing, being able to be heard and having an opportunity to, to explain yourself. I love that. That's, that's, Mick, that's, can that's, I, that's so I, important. I will, Mick, Teddy, yes. Can, over can, to you. can I say something quickly? Sure. I, I just want to say I love that story from Esther. I mean, how wonderful that uh, the head of YouTube is saying, let's take our children's phones away uh, because you know, the kids are in the world, of course, watching YouTube all the time. I love that, Esther. Fantastic. And uh, the CEO of 23andMe uh, saying, take the kids' uh, phones away. Um, and, and also the way that they resolved it. But ju just to say how, how, how important it is, you know, um, you, you know, we've got two little kids and we have movie night one, once a week. And I tell you, we kind of dread it because uh, a five-year-old and a two-year-old after watching a couple hours of uh, whatever they watch um, and we watch with them, it's, it, it's just, you know, manic beyond belief. And... Uh, and, and I mean, we've all had these experiences of how different kids deal with uh, technology and, 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 and so on. But it is so critical during this time of lockdown. I mean, kids are in schools. So, some of these schools are going from like eight to three every day, eight to four, just on screens all day. These young kids just bombarded with, you know, um, just this, you know, technological stream of information and not getting outside, not playing, you, you know, it's critical for kids to be having exercise, making sure they're getting enough sleep, not to be using technology before sleep if possible, so that they can sleep properly and soundly, sleeping in a dark, quiet room, um, and, and making sure they're eating healthily, they're getting play and other stimulation. Uh, so I was just inspired by Esther's story. So uh, it, it is critical that it doesn't just become this on, ongoing screen time. Um, it's just going to make our kids crazy. And if the head of YouTube says it, we should listen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I would definitely yes that's that. a good idea. Yeah, I, I think that that's great. Um, I just, it, it actually sparked something in me because my, my parents are extraordinary and 
they took us to every um, religious denomination. So they took us to a church, they took us to a mosque, they took us to a temple, they took us to a monastery. And then at the end of it, we'd done these, these travels and they said, you know, now choose which religion or which faith, if any, you relate to. It is your life, it is your choice. And my brother and I, we were tiny. You know, so they gave us this incredible responsibility to choose these beautiful values and and visions and and morals that we wanted to have in our lives. And I think that giving that choice is empowering at every single age. And, you know, it's always in the question, right? Like we, we've been talking a little bit about the solutions. And I just want to go back and say it's in the question. And when you structure the question to probe curiosity and to probe self-reflection and to probe collaboration, you, you, you get completely different people. It's in the question that we ask ourselves and the question that we ask when we're standing in front of a classroom or even in a workplace, even in a, a family setting. And that can really make or break an education system. So I find it hugely inspiring. You know, the more um, trust and the more creative space we give to develop, definitely we're gonna see the rewards of that in the future of education. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. I, and I also love the, the whole concept of responsible kids, not just responsible adults, responsible kids. So, um, Yoss, we've got another question that's, that's been asked um, around AR. How can we make sure that we can use AR to benefit in education? It was asked by um, Ryan Davis. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks so much for your question, Ryan. AI can be used in many different ways in education, from doing something like running, you know, attendance records and seeing who's coming and who's not and where people are spending their time when they're online learning. It's, there's so many different ways that we can use AI or, or predictive analytics. But for us, we want to go deeper than that. And we see a real responsibility when it comes to creating conscious AI. So really developing the right algorithms that help build a relationship between the human and the technology that they're using. And it's definitely not a 24-7 thing, but it has to be something that we start being really smart about because it's not going anywhere. So to answer your question, there's many different ways. Like every single technology can be used to, first of all, it can be used to invoke fear or create love, right? So those are two options. So we're going to go with the love option. And as a result of that, for us, the inspiration is really in developing educational solutions that allow more people to have better access to the quality learning that they need at that time. And that's what the beauty of AI is as well, right? It can be so personalized. And that's something that we're not yet capitalizing on, but it's right around the corner and it's super exciting. It really is the future of learning. So I hope that answers your question. But in short, like every technology, many different uses. So same with the internet, you can use it for many different things. In our case, we like to come from a love and conscious based perspective, one that's scalable, sustainable, and will hugely impact the future of learning. Thanks. And just to add to that, uh, in our tech news section a bit earlier, we saw that Effectiva is uh, developing AR that will look at the student and be able to uh, see their emotions and feed that back to the teacher to, to help them understand what is being learned. Um, but that also brings up a lot of ethical debate around that technology. So we'll just leave that there. Um, let's move on to another question here. We have got so many questions. Let's see which one to pick. Um, so somebody, so Palat, is wondering, is this new technology, which we have to start and embrace, will it make it easier or worse for disadvantaged groups in very remote areas? Mick, I'm happy to give that a shot, um, if that's okay. But yeah, sure. I love that question. I, I, I really love that question. I think it's so important. So we've actually built, um, the AI so that it speaks a hundred languages, for example, and that there are functionalities that are inclusive um, for hard hearing, for example, or for different levels of eyesight capability. 
I love that question because it's not just a barrier of, you know, whether or not we have certain technology or not. There are so many different barriers that we have to think about when it comes to education. So asking that, you know, it, yeah, do we have the right access to internet? Can we really consume a video? Do we really want to consume that video? So building with accessibility in mind is a key responsibility for anybody working using education and technology. For anybody who's taking up that responsibility, it definitely has to be a main focus. Um, and that's something that has been at the core of what we believe in. And um, we like to surround ourselves by people that believe the same. So if you feel the same way, please shout, give us a shout. But no, it's, it's definitely key and it has to be top of mind. Data, accessibility, even the type of devices, um, even the, the literacy skills, there are so many things that we have to think about, and and we we have to think about them. They're they're good to think about as well. Yeah, and 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 you can look at the data global to be learning express. Sorry, Ted. I was just saying that uh, we need to work with government, and we need to find a way that data can be made available and accessible, pretty much free for everybody, because it needs to become a human right that everybody can access data in an unlimited fashion, um, and, and then we'll have much more equity uh, in terms of Polite's question, but at the moment, of course, there's huge inaccessibility for huge numbers of people in South Africa, um, and then you just have to use the technology that um, is most accessible, and that's why we're building so many things, for example, on WhatsApp, um, because it's just one of the most ubiquitous technologies, WhatsApp, Facebook, etc. Um, but we, we need a data solution, and we all need to work together, South Africans, on a big-scale data solution. Thanks, thanks for that, Ted. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about the Global Learning XPRIZE, which is part of the XPRIZE Foundation, mm -hmm. where they create these huge prizes to solve some of the big challenges in the world. And the Global Learning XPRIZE was awarded to two teams last year, where if they could... Um, get students to learn basic math and English without a teacher of 18 months um, with a tablet that would win the, a $5 million prize at, or a $10 million prize. And uh, two teams just landed up winning now. The, the competition has been running for five or six years. And at the end of last year, someone won. So we should be seeing that technology being open sourced and available uh, very soon this, this year, hopefully. <laughs> So guys, we, we're running it's quite, quite uh, out of time. There's just too many questions to, to answer them all. We will try to get to some of these questions offline. Um, to the panel, do you guys want to have any, just a 30 second closing statement on uh, how you think we should reimagine education in the future? And we can start with Esther. Well, I'll start with the, Esther had start a hand with the closing Esther had statement. Hand I did, yes. <laughs> Um, I think reimagining education for the future. I think we need to reimagine the student as CEO of their learning more than we ever did before. So if we can give the student as much control that is possible within the constraints of the learning program, I think that we will find that students will be much more excited about their learning and the teachers will work uh, it won't be as difficult for them because I think one of the keys to getting kids to learn is to get them interested. And once you get them interested in something, then you can pretty much teach them anything. And when you give them opportunity to be in control, that gives them the opportunity to develop that interest. So that's what I would like to leave everybody with. And the um, internet provides us an opportunity to give as many people as possible opportunities to find their interest. Thanks so much for that. Uh, who wants to go next? <laughs> Ted? Just, yes, you go. Yes, ladies first. All right, awesome. Um, First of all, massive gratitude to you guys for putting on another great show and for all the awesome people that tuned in on their Monday uh, morning or afternoon or evening. Really appreciate the just the, the interest always in this in this incredible topic. It's such a powerful topic. 
there's so many different ways to go about this. And at the end of the day, you know, we want to have an open conversation. So please feel free to reach out. Um, you can find our information. I think Mick will has circulated our names. Um, I'm, I don't want to speak for Taddy and Esther, but I'm sure they're happy to receive your questions as well. But please feel free to reach out. If you have ideas or if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, drop me a line. Um, we're very excited about this future and building it together and opening up real conscious learning to as many people as possible. Thanks, Jess. Stunning. Yeah, I just really love what Esther and, and Jos said about the future of learning. And um, I, th I think the future of learning is incredibly exciting. And as Jos said, just welcoming everybody to get involved. We've got this wonderful opportunity in South Africa's school system. Please contact us, get involved in eCubed. It's, it's, it's a platform for um, you know, corporations, for um, uh, nonprofits, for parents, for civil society organizations, etc to contribute to helping create a 21st century learning system in South Africa. Um, and, and just th this, this is the time where really, because of the COVID shakeup, we can reinvent education, where we must fight for great education. We mustn't just let it happen stands, happen to chance, because our future absolutely depends on the quality of education and what our education is. And um, I always say it's not, it's not like everyone's so worried about, are we going to be on 5G or 6G or this G? It's not the speed of the network. It's the speed of the brain. It's the creativity of the brain. It's what a human being is and can become. And there's no limit to that, uh, that genius that a human being can achieve. And we have to know that and believe that because that's true. Um, but as Esther said, Learning has to be, she used the word, every learner must be the CEO of their own learning. And we've got to make learning learner-centered. So the teacher's role is critical. We have to love and respect our teachers. But the role of the teachers ultimately is to wake up that student inside. So we have to be brave. We have to go for it. Let's fight for it. And let, let's create the future we want for South Africa. Thanks so much, Ted. And, and uh, thanks to, so much to our whole panel. You guys are amazing. You're doing incredible things. And uh, please don't stop. Just keep pushing harder. Go all in. And I'm, I'm sure you all will. Um, it's really been a pleasure. And we are grateful that you took the time to be here with us. And um, don't go anywhere. We've got our giveaways up next. Thanks so much, guys. You. We'll see. We're going to be carrying on this conversation. Now it's time to give back, sharing the tech love. This is our way of giving back. And each week, all the registered guests go into a random draw and some lucky winners will be eligible to win various prizes. The prizes will vary from physical to digital products. Tonight, we have some really cool giveaways. We'll give away two of Esther's books, one which is How to Raise Successful People and the other is Global Moonshots in Education, as well as Two of Joss's books, How Good Girls Do Good, which is an augmented reality book for girls, and Tackled, an education book that includes Sia Khaleesi. Right, so let's draw our winners. Tamsin, please roll the dice. And our three winners are Sandile Dai, Lauren Hoden Cross, Gareth Island, and Milani Ramasani. You both will be winning each one of those books, as I mentioned, in that order. Congratulations to our winners. Our team will be in contact with you to get you your prize. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us tonight. I hope you had a good time and took away some insights and knowledge on how we can reimagine education. It's, we all need to stick together and collaborate so that we can come through out of this ahead. And let's be part of the solution. Next week, we'll be looking at designing the food of the future. How can we create food security now in this dire time, as well as in the future, as the global population grows? And we'll be looking at topics from making eggs without chickens with Arturo Elizondo from Clara Foods, to redefining where meat comes from with Mark Post, who invented the $300,000 synthetic meat burger, 
as well as Andile Nkobo, a 25-year-old farmer doing incredible things on the farming front on the ground here in South Africa. Make sure to register on our website, get informed about all the updates and stand a chance to win in the next Share the Tech Love giveaway. You can join any of our social media platforms as well as like and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified of all of our uh, shows. Lastly, please help educate students from Maharishi Institute by donating. All you have to do is scan the QR code on the screen and the proceeds go to buying data and devices for students to keep them learning remotely. Let's help these students keep going. It's extremely important for humanity to stay connected and positive about the future because positive ideas and actions change the world and we have the power to overcome these challenges through collaboration.